What's going on everybody? Welcome to the reveal of number 20 in my power rankings, a deep dive into the Detroit Lions. Before we jump in here, real quick, the upload frequency is going to drop off for about the next three weeks. I'll be traveling across Europe. I'm going to try to continue getting those Jets rebuilds out to you guys fairly frequently and then hopefully going to have enough to edit up a couple deep dives while I'm over there. But, uh, you know, until July 19th, things are going to slow down. But this channel has been growing so much over the last three, four months. Whether you are newer to the channel or you've been here from the beginning, I want to thank all of you for enjoying these videos, for staying active, commenting, liking videos. This has been a ride the last few months and a lot of fun to see this channel grow. Really excited for another football season and to go into a new year with you guys. Uh, so cheers. So let's get into the Lions here coming in at number 20, which is pretty consistent with how most people view this team. ESPN has them 20th, NFL a little higher at 16th. And, you know, I, I realize I'm not winning any favors from the Lions fans. You're probably going to disagree with this and are going to be frustrated that I'm not saying that this is going to be a better version of the 2016 team that made the playoffs. You know, I get it. The running game should be better. You got a defensive coach now. There are reasons to be optimistic about this team, but the fact of the matter is the NFC is a freaking gauntlet, and you can improve your team and still be one of the five or six quote-unquote worst teams in the division. So that's kind of where I come in with Detroit. I don't want to be viewed as being pessimistic about this team. I really like a lot of things they've done, but when your expectations are, like I mentioned, potentially playoffs and beyond, you know, you really got to look at things at a different lens than someone like the Jets. So let's get into it here. We're going to go through the positional grades and then look at the schedule, talk about my expectations for this team. Starting with the quarterback, Matthew Stafford coming in at number 10 in the NFL. Now he really impressed me two years ago, I think took a massive tear jump up for me. You know, I used to view him as sort of this Jay Cutler guy who would focus in on Calvin Johnson too much, force some things, really lacked consistency. But in 2016, really showed me the ability to elevate the play of guys around him the number one thing you look for in elite quarterbacks my only concern with Stafford would be that he still has some consistency issues a lot of the times he has these fourth quarter comebacks and he gets a lot of credit for those as he should but in the scheme of things a lot of times the reason he needs to have those fourth quarter comebacks is he really struggles earlier on in the game for the first two or three quarters so to really become that consistently elite tier one type of quarterback, your Rodgers, Luck, Brady, you know, you got to do it for four quarters every week. So then you've also got Matt Castle here, by the way, is the backup. But, you know, if anything happened to Stafford, obviously you can forget about it for this team. Then at running back, uh, this team has had such a hard time running the ball really for the last decade. Seems everyone they try out flops here. The only successful ones have been Reggie Bush, Theo Riddick, the guys that can catch the ball out of the backfield. So I was really critical of them taking Carrion Johnson over Darius Geis. And then everyone freaks out and says, why do you hate Carrion Johnson? I don't hate Carrion Johnson. Go and watch my pre-draft rankings for running backs. I, I liked him. I had a third round grade on him. But I think Geis would have offered a true power run game identity, especially when you've already got a receiving back there in Theo Riddick. And I get it. Carrion Johnson was a power back in college for sure and a good one scored a ton of goal line touchdowns was used in short yardage ran up the middle all that stuff so there's no reason he can't become that I just liked guys better as that but my main concern with Carrion is that he's lost a big chunk of weight transitioning to the NFL he was down to 205 at his pro day Detroit drafted him at that weight so we'll see if he puts weight back on. He clearly, personally, wants to transition to being an outside zone runner, a receiving back. Some things that he definitely showed the ability to do in college, perhaps, was underutilized, though, in that regard, which is fine. There's really good running backs like that. You know, I think of Tevin Coleman, Jarek McKinnon. I just think Geis may have had Marshawn Lynch upside. So we'll see it, what Carrion Johnson is at the next level tons of people have him pegged as you know the rookie breakout the rookie sensation i'm not going that far i think it's a great fit and i like his talent but there's other guys here they're going to get in his way you do got theo riddick one of the best receiving backs in the nfl if not the best you got legarrett blunt here who's going to challenge him for those goal line situations at least in the first year you also got zach zenner who this team trusts 
And then all the way down here, you got Amir Abdullah and Dwayne Washington, two of the more physical freaks on this team, but just haven't been able to put it together skill-wise. So I actually think Abdullah is going to be on his way out, could get cut this year. Also, a shout-out to Nick Bodden. San Diego State had a big role in Rashad Penny's success down there. Really good blocking fullback. So normally I would talk about receiver, but because it is so important how big of a jump this team can make in terms of running the ball, which has been the number one emphasis for this team, obviously if you look at their draft, they want to run the ball better this year. So let's talk about this offensive line. Now on paper, really good offensive line. I rank them as uh, tied for the 10th best line in football. And I like a lot of the moves they made. I really liked the Frank Ragnow pick. He should come in and be a top 10 or 15 center right away and spark this offensive line. You're going to move Graham Glasgow to left guard. That's fine. And then you got Taylor Decker, stud left tackle. Wick Wagner, as he's known on this channel, at right tackle and TJ Lang. Now, the one thing I will say is if you look back before last season started, we were saying the same exact thing, that they signed TJ Lang and Wagner and this should be a much improved run game well it didn't really work out so we'll have to wait and see what this team can achieve offensively Jim Bob Cooter still the offensive coordinator here who, who runs that west coast kind of horizontal offense type of thing where a lot of the run game is through screens and bubble passes and that kind of thing so we still have to take somewhat of a wait and see approach with this offensive line and this run game theoretically should be better. And then I also need to mention they take Tyrell Crosby, a total steal in the fifth round. It's going to be a versatile depth play here who can really come in and play at any position outside of maybe center if they get an injury. So now let's move on to this receiving core. I really like this receiving core. I think it, you definitely make the argument is the deepest group of receivers in the league. My only problem here and the reason they're not a top 10 group, they do rank 11th, is that they don't really have that true number one elite type of receiver. The best they have here is Marvin Jones, who has really impressed me. And this is the perfect example of Matthew Stafford elevating a guy around him. I like Marvin Jones quite a bit. I just think he just might be the best number two wide receiver in the league. Uh, just isn't quite at that level of a true number one. One of the best receivers in the NFL at winning contested ball situations, but he does have a lot of contested ball situations. He's not uh, an elite receiver at creating separation and getting open. So then behind Jones, you got Kenny Galladay, and can he become a true number one. He's got the size speed combination of an AJ Green. Really showed up when he got his opportunities last year. I'm a big fan of Kenny Galladay. Was extremely high on him coming out. So he's going to be a really fun player to watch this year to see what kind of player he can become. Still very young as well. And then you got Golden Tate here right there with Jarvis Landry and Larry Fitzgerald as the best slot receiver in the NFL. So one through three, you got a great group of receivers here. And then also got to mention TJ Jones, who really stepped up when he got on the field last year. Not a whole lot of people behind those four, these tight ends. It's very much whatever as it was last year. This team is free of the Eric Ebron curse. So they bring in Luke Wilson, Levine Toilolo, you got Michael Roberts here, a fourth round pick last year who showed some things. But again, just like it was last year, it's probably going to be a healthy rotation between those three. So you got a bunch of playmakers here, just maybe not an elite level playmaker like an Odell Beckham, Julio Jones, DeAndre Hopkins, Rob Gronkowski, David Johnson. You know, these true game breaking offensive weapons. You know, Detroit's lack of that might be the only thing keeping them outside of the top 10 for me as far as their offensive grade is concerned. They do come in at 11th offensively. So it's not like I think it's gonna be a bad offense. It's gonna be a very good offense as it has been. For the last couple of years and if they can establish a really good run game then that would be enough to push them into a top 10 offense consistently so let's move on to the defense here they, they bring in matt patricia as the new head coach he's going to try and replicate in his own way what they did in new england which has become known as this legendary defensive scheme the do your job mentality a lot of rotation, just gap control, discipline, all those things. And when you look at Detroit's depth chart here defensively, Matt Patricia might be the best guy here to kind of save things because when you look at the front seven especially, and we break this down by run defense, pass rush, and linebackers, it's a huge mishmash of guys with really no impact players in the front seven. The closest thing 
to an impact player is Ziggy Ansa. So we'll start with the pass rush, I suppose. Look, Ziggy Ansa is the guy in this front seven that most people are aware of. He did have nine sacks last year, so most of the box score chasers are going to think he's still got it. But he did only have about 20 pressures last year. This team franchise tags him, not committing to him long term, recognizing that he has to return to what he used to be to be worth that payday. Reminds me a lot of Jason Pierre-Paul, really across the board, in terms of who he is as a player and his career trajectory. So that said, this scheme, assuming we are talking about the Patriots defensive scheme here, doesn't put a lot of emphasis on having a dominant pass rush. They are more about gap control, moving defensive linemen around, playing matchups. And when you look at the rest of this defensive line, you've got Ashawn Robinson and Sylvester Williams here as your defensive tackles. But you look at really the rest of the guys here, Jeremiah Ledbetter, Anthony Zettel, Cornelius Washington, Kerry Hyder. All of these guys are, uh, oh, and Deshaun Hand, by the way, a fourth round pick who was used very similarly uh, for Alabama. It's pretty impressive how they built this roster with these guys because all of them are guys you can move around between, you know, three techs out to five techs and even beyond. So it's gonna be really interesting because Patricia does have the pieces to move this around and try and do what he did in New England. And if he can get it to work, which I'm not gonna project that to happen because it's a pretty big jump. It's not a ton of talent here, but I do like the versatility. But uh, if he can get that to work and all these guys to click and find their role and do their job, Belichickian style, this could instantly take a jump up uh, from a team that on paper I have as the 27th run defense and 25th pass rush and I'm just kind of meshing these together because these roles are undefined you know it's the type of thing where you can elevate the play of these guys within a scheme and turn this into a top 12 defense but it's going to be a wait and see game there and then you talk about these linebackers again it's more of the same but way less talent in my opinion you do have Gerard Davis freak athlete out of Florida like him, showed some nice things, got injured. Uh, so, you know, he should take a nice step up. But then you got Christian Jones, Devin Kennard, Jalen Reeves Maven, Steve Longa, Jonathan Freeney. Literally no one I'm excited about. Not a good group of linebackers. He was able to make it work last year for New England without really any linebackers. So, again, wait and see here. Uh, they do come in tied with five other teams uh, for the 24th best group of linebackers uh, and then cam johnson here as well worth mentioning kind of a flex outside linebacker edge rusher type of dude uh, but then as you get into secondary things get a little better here you obviously have darius slay and glover quinn who uh, yeah quinn's getting a little older but this is still one of the best safety corner combos in the league darius slay just might be underrated as one of the best three or four corners in this league i prefer him to his divisional counterpart Xavier Rhodes, who is consistently ranked above him. I just think Slay is much more consistent. Uh, and then you got an interesting combination of dudes. So you got uh, Tease Tabor here at corner, opposite of Slay. Really big fan of Tease Tabor. Reminds me a good bit of Joe Hayden coming out of Florida himself. Obviously not at that level yet, but I think, you know, has shown enough things to give you reason to think that that could happen. So we'll see how he develops. Then you've got a bunch of really good nickel defenders here. Nevin Lawson, Quandre Diggs, Miles Killebrew, Deshaun Shedd, all these guys. Uh, Tavon Wilson as well. These are all really good nickel defenders, nickel corners, slot safeties, you know, that kind of thing. They're going to move them around and cause a lot of headaches within this defense. So I like the secondary a lot. They do take Tracy Walker as well in the third round. Hard to see him getting on the field amidst this deep group of guys in his first year, uh, but some upside there going down the road. So that wraps up the roster review. Again, this team coming in 11th for offense, 26th for defense, and then I do have them coming in 26 for coaching culture so i was kind of talking up matt patricia but i do also have some concerns that that was all bill belichick there in new england you know i, I don't hate matt patricia or anything i'm giving him a chance clearly uh, saying he he could certainly carry things over and elevate the play of this kind of middling group of defenders here so it's definitely going to be some wait and see here 
with Matt Patricia and this defense. So let's go ahead and talk schedule here. You know, we mentioned this NFC and how tough it is, and you can see it right off the bat with this schedule. They do start with the Jets at home, give them that win, but then you got to go to San Francisco. Jimmy Garoppolo honestly might know this Patricia defense better than its own defenders at that point in the season, so that could get ugly. can certainly see that being a, a bet for me that week. And then you got New England at home. you got to go to Dallas. you got Green Bay really really hard stretch they can certainly win that one in miami i did give that to miami but then really down the rest of the stretch a bunch of really tough games no easy wins the worst team is buffalo but you do gotta go to buffalo where they are a significantly better team so it's not such a bad team that they're going to roll over against any of these opponents you know it's a team that's going to play a lot of close games and they can hang with really anyone uh, so I gave them wins against Seattle, Carolina, the Rams, even Minnesota, all teams I have ranked above them. But it is pretty hard to sit here and say which games it's going to be that they can pull out. So overall, I do have a very small win range, four to seven for this team. The schedule is just so hard. Vegas agrees over under is eight and uh, the under does not pay very well. So they're picking under. Uh, in the end, I think they can get six. Um, my schedule predictions here, it's, it's not going to look anything like this. There's going to be games here that they win, that I said they lost, and vice versa. Um, but I do think overall, it's about what it's going to look like when all is said and done. So Detroit fans, do let me know your thoughts. What are your expectations? Do you expect this team to make the playoffs with this tough schedule? If you're not a Lions fan, what do you think? Is this rating spot on? Is it too high, too low? Definitely let me know in the comments below. If you enjoyed the video, guys, do like it. If you learn a thing or two, do hit that like button. It helps me out a lot. So as always, cheers, guys. Again, I'll be out of the country, so don't expect a lot of response from me. I'll be on vacation. So peace out. We'll see you next time.